such a pleasure to be here. Um, I often have to travel quite far to do talks, so this was a real pleasure. I think it took me about three minutes. <laughs> and it probably would have taken me about a minute if I hadn't got lost. <laughs> so uh, you're very usefully located in terms of uh, where my office is. And uh, um, it's great to, I mean, it was slightly, slightly trepidatious coming to a place uh, where you uh, analyze and present and uh, statistics and, uh, and um, I'm interested, however, that however precise you may be, um, the time at the Royal Statistical Society, at least in this room, is always at four minutes past seven. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, <laughs> clock, uh, or, uh, what, is, what is that line from Withnell and I, even a stopped clock tells the right time once a day. <laughs> so I'm so happy to be here at precisely four minutes past seven. And uh, I was, we'll still be here at four minutes past seven, <laughs> unless someone fixes it meanwhile. So you will have to do the wind-up noise since that clock uh, well, well, yeah, yeah, no, no, stopped banging on. But anyway, no, it's a real pleasure. Um, I, I wrote this book um, about, about a year ago and came up with this name, um, Eggs or Anarchy. I sort of, it, it occurred to me because it very much summed up the sort of dramatic situation that, that Lord Walton found himself in. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this man and uncover uh, the story of what I think is quite extraordinary. And it really set my imagination alight, and I felt very lucky when I came across this story. Now, you know him because he was a former president of the, the RSS, and I came across a, um, a speech that he made. It was his presidential address. I suspect you made one too. No, 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 not yet. A few weeks time. A few weeks time. Um, uh, on November the 22nd. And it's interesting because one of the things that I learned about Lord Wilton was that he was quite sort of modern, he had extraordinary foresight. And the things that he said in his speech um, back in, uh, I think it was 1945, when, when he became, yeah. Um, he talked about the fact that um, statisticians throughout the war had proved the competence of the statistician. Really, lots of facts and figures have been incredibly useful in terms of creating po policy. And he said that that, com that proved competence had given much stimulus to those who believe in national planning. Um, he recognized that unemployment was the most urgent social problem confronting the modern state. And he believed that using statistical measures, measures of ordering those operations in our economic life that are within the control and competence of the government can, in large measure, measure solve a lot of those problems, such as unemployment. And he, he said rather passionately, we must have knowledge of facts and a capacity to forecast future trends from those facts. And, you know, when you hear someone talking about that, it sounds uh, as if it could be said by some rather sensible person in public policy today. And as I talk about him, I think you'll, I, I hope you will appreciate that he was a really extraordinary radical figure. And the conceit of my book is not just that there happened to be a man who was administering um, the food policy during the Second World War, but that actually without this extraordinary man, Britain could have actually starved. And uh, that's my sort of, my, my argument, my presentation as to why I think Lord Walton is so important. And I think many of his, of his successes uh, saw him being rewarded by the role of president of your society, as well as uh, becoming later, latterly, the um, chairman of the Conservative Party, although he was by no means sort of right of centre for much of his life, but I'll talk about that. So um, uh, there's the book. Uh, uh, there is this batty, battered, sorry, copy of the book circulating. Uh, fortunately, I have brought some fresh hardware. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you, I, I won't stop you from uh, buying them, and I'll even put my paw print in if that's a help. Um, so um, why did I, a food writer, somebody who pops up on MasterChef and sort of judges souffles and edits a magazine for a supermarket come across this idea and why did I end up writing about Lord Wilson? Well, I wrote a book in about 2011, uh, which is called A History of Food and 100 Recipes, which I sort of hope is a sort of witty sweep through food history. It begins in a, uh, in a, in a tomb in ancient Egypt above the hills of, of Luxor, where I find what I argue is the earliest recipe. It's a recipe for Egyptian flatbreads that I have translated from the hieroglyphics in an extraordinary tomb, a tomb to a womb, and it kind of ends in the present day. But while I was in the process of doing this book, of course I, had to, I came 
to a, there were several pivotal moments, one of which was during the Second World War, when I was looking at how Britain was fed and the personalities that were involved in that. There were all sorts of people such as Marguerite Patton and others who became sort of celebrity home economists, whose job it was to inspire the home cook, to cook with the ration. And as I was looking at this, I came across this figure of Lord Wilton. Now, I'd all, I heard of Wilton through this sort of rather tedious story of Wilton Pie. Mm. It did at least make him famous. Um, it, was a, it was a sort of PR effort to try and make the ration sort of uh, into a warming pie. Um, and it did sort of carry his name for a future generation, so it did do that. Uh, as your president suggested, um, everywhere, everywhere he met, he was made these damn pies, and now everywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> so I came across this man, I thought, who was Lord Walton? And I came across a photocopy page of his um, uh, biography. Um, I later came across a copy of the whole book, it was quite a dry read. But within, within that book, I came across the bare bones of a story of how, when Lord Walton was trying to get um, rice, particularly, out of um, Egypt. He sent one of his sort of flunkies from the Ministry of Food, and he sort of, what I gathered, he, he tacitly consented to say to this guy, look, I don't mind how you get this rice, just make sure you get enough of it. And in doing that, I kind of had the idea that he must have broken his own rules, because I found this quote, just how we got the rice out of Egypt was something into which I never thought it necessary to inquire. <laughs> and when his head of rice tried to explain how it was that he'd managed to get the extra 100,000 tons that Walton had urged him to do, Walton didn't want to know anything about it. So this occurred, this was thought to me, this is an amazing story, I think, because you've got a man, a very important politician, representing the establishment's view that part of the success of winning the war <coughs> is to adhere to the ration, not to break the rules and engage in black market activities, while at the same time tacitly <laughs> consenting to his own members of staff to do exactly that, to break those rules, albeit on the back streets of, of um, places like Cairo. And so I sort of punted this story around, thinking <coughs> there must be a, a story here. And um, my publisher of my first book sort of uh, uh, pitched up at Simon and Schuster and said, yeah, this is great, can you do it? At which point you kind of go, oh God, all I've got is one story and an idea. Um, which, has, which often is the case when you sort of, you know, you, you sort of pitch a story. And then I got really, really lucky because I discovered an extraordinary resource of material. Firstly, I met Lord Walton's grandson, a great man who works in finance called Simon Walton. And he said, I think my grandfather's diaries are sitting in the western wing of the Bodleian Library, so why don't you go there? Mm -hmm. And I went there, and I found um, in several boxes all of his papers, and you open up these sort of little uh, cardboard files, and you twizzle the cotton, and you open it up, and there was sheet after sheet of typed up manuscript of his diaries. Um, and I, my, you know, my hair stood on end. I was absolutely astonished because I thought, has no one seen these things? And I looked through the register of people who'd been in there, and it was only people like William Shawcross, royal biographer, who'd ring them up to sign and find any mentions of the royal family, the queen mother, and so on. Um, and as I read them, I came across just the most extraordinary, punchy, almost aggressive a tone of voice, a very modern thinking, very open, very graphic, a man who spoke very graphically about his colleagues, who, who, you know, whereas in his memoirs he was very formal and quite stiff, his diaries were his private thoughts that he set down for posterity night after night <coughs> in the couple, in the couple's flat, him and his wife Maud, that they shared in Whitehall. And I was amazed because it was rather like as a journalist sort of interviewing someone and thinking, God, he said that, he said that. Mm -hmm. And I would go back day after day to check all these things and, 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 and start writing them, writing up <coughs> my notes from them, uh, worried that some other journalist would discover this because I thought, surely everyone's written everything there is to be known about the Second World War. So I was lucky with that regard, and much of my book is made up of um, the, using that source. The other incredible resource that I found uh, was Maud's diary. <clears throat> now, Maud was his wife, and I'll talk a little bit about her in due course. They were sort of joined at the hip, really, passionate couple, passion, passionate Unitarians, passionate with social policy and so on. And um, she was devoted to her husband and his work, and actually would often carry out um, things, his, his duties, such as opening 
British restaurants with the sort of wartime canteens on his behalf. And every night, the couple would talk about his day. She would write her version of events, and he would write his. And I was given this massive great ledger, which was bolted shut. No one had the key. The family said, yeah, you can open it. We've never looked at it before. And there was page after page after page, Maud's diaries, writing about her meetings with Churchill, his meetings with Churchill, the meetings they have with the royal family, and no one had ever come across this resource. And this was really exciting. And I sat on the terrace of a house in France, hollowed over my children, and, and kind of got my head around this scrawl, and again came across the most explosive quotes. So it was, as a journalist, it was extremely exciting. I also found lots of papers, family papers, letters, letters from um, Fred's mother, um, letters between the two of them. So using that and other public resources, I was able to build up a picture in order to write this book. Now, it's quite a biased picture because it's Lord Walton's story. Um, you know, this is not the entire story of the war. It's, a, it's sort of a story of, of, of it sort of completes the backstory of part of the home front how Britain was fed. But it's a sort of defense and it's an articulate, I hope, exposition of what Walton did. That's me sitting there bashing out all these things. It's quite fun when you do that bit, you know I, mean? I don't quite know why there's a carafe of claret in the top right mm. -hmm. corner of that picture because I, I can only write if I'm completely stone cold sober. But I brought all these resources together and was able to write the story. So who was Fred Marquis? Um, has quite a grand name. Uh, in fact, he was emphatically working class. Marcus is a, a northern name. Um, and he was, he was plain Fred, born in a working class street of Salford, now long demolished in Manchester. Um, his father was uh, an itinerant saddler who had only the bare bones of literacy. If you look at um, when I came across some of his, his letters, son, father to son, there's no grammar, quite a lot of spelling mistakes. There wasn't much that his father, Thomas, really did. Um, uh, according to family papers, or certainly letters from Fred's mother to, to her son, uh, he seemed to spend most of his time sort of shifting cupboards, putting down rat poisoning, and basically mumbling and grumbling about life. He wasn't a great high achiever. His father, in turn, was a <coughs> poor pub landlord from Lancashire. So along comes Fred, a scion of this, this humble working class family, um, but he's very bright. And he's determined to sort of break away from this. And he, he gets himself a very good education. He's educated in Manchester. <clears throat> and then he's offered a place um, at Cambridge, uh, much to his mother's huge pride. She was, she was, however, sort of terrified that her son, Fred, was going to leave the family nest. She spent most of her time in her letters fussing about the fact that one day her son might leave her and what on earth would she do. And she really seemed to rely on, on him, uh, her own son. And Fred turns down this place at Cambridge. Now, there's two theories as to why. One is that he felt that he didn't have the adequate funds to be able to keep up with the highfalutin society that, would, that was existing in Cambridge. But also, I came across a letter in which Thomas warns his son Fred that if he leaves, he might well die because he's extremely ill and it would be a very selfish act. Now, Thomas lived for another 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> Fred never got that <coughs> education at Cambridge, um, but he did, however, get educated in Manchester. And it was literally in his late teens and early 20s that he started to develop uh, a passion for, for social problems. He, he, he went to places like Liverpool as well as Manchester, positioned himself in a, in a very rundown street in order to study the effects of poverty. Uh, he wanted to know why people um, didn't have food, how much money you had to have to actually qualify to be poor. He became obsessed with things like dental health. He became obsessed with the nutrition of children. Uh, a woman three doors away from the very street in which he was living with his other students died one day of starvation. This was hugely shocking for him because he couldn't believe in that day and age that someone could just starve to death in a, in a, in a street, in a, in a city in this country. And it really galvanized him to work out the causes of poverty and starvation and as I say, the, the causes of bad health and the importance of nutrition. And so when he then became Minister of Food 20, 30 years later, you know, his journey to that role had actually become in his late teens. So there was, he was incredibly qualified for that. He also met Maud while studying at university, and they had a very sort of formal dalliance before they, they met and married. 
And as I say, they were devoted to each other. The letters that I found between the two of them, uh, very passionate, right up into that, you know, right up to when he's in his late 50s and 60s. Um, he writes to her, um, my darling Willie, you know, I'll miss you this evening because I'm doing a talk. Can't wait to see you. You know, just wonderful romance between the two of them all through their life. And uh, um, they had a couple of, couple of kids, Roger and Peggy. Roger, in fact, uh, really struggled under the, uh, under the sort of shadow of his father's brilliance and his intellect and his success. And I think uh, uh, died actually in his early 40s from alcoholism, really couldn't cope. But his father, Fred, um, uh, into his early 20s, got a career at Lewis's. Now, Fred was always an entrepreneur and uh, he was always dabbling in things. He did a bit of journalism. He became uh, obsessed with, with leather, in particular galoshes. And he thought, well, it's raining a lot. It must be raining a lot in America. If I can get hold of these galoshes, I can take them to America, sell the Americans these waterproof overshoes, and I'll make an absolute fortune. So he hopped on the Queen Mary boat to New York. And during that journey, he met a man called Cohen, who happened to run one of the country's um, growing department store chains, brands. And Cohen was rather fascinated by this young man and his obsession for leather and boots. And um, Fred, by this time, he never, he was, never did things in small measures. He actually became, um, I think, chairman of the Leather Boot uh, Corporation. He never did anything in half measures. And Cohen was fascinated by this young man. She said, well, I'm going to join you as you go around for a few weeks trying to sell your boots. Now, it so happened that the Galosha thing, Galoshes thing never took off. On the boat journey back, Cohen said to, to Fred, why don't you come and join my firm? I could do with a, a man like you. And over the next 20 years, Fred, who became managing director, turned Lewis's into the most successful department store chain in this country. Um, they had stores right across the country. These beautiful, elegant department stores from Glasgow, Manchester, to Liverpool. Um, and uh, he ended up buying Selfridges off Gordon Selfridges just at, just at the end of the war. So he was a very successful retailer. Um, he was clothing and providing um, uh, the British public with things from through his shop. So he had a knack and he understood consumerism and what people of this country needed. And he was getting to his late 50s, he was about 49, 59 years old, as um, war broke out, the Second World War. Now, he wasn't asked to serve in any military capacity because he'd always had a certain degree of ill health, he had colitis. He had real sort of gas, gastro problems, um, which meant that he actually had a natural affinity um, with humble, good, solid, nourishing food, and he hated anything rich. He hated it mentally, the idea of sort of lobsters and champagne. He physically couldn't cope with it either. Again, rather handy for the man who's going to come, become an industry of food. And so this elegant man who's gone from being a um, humble, working-class boy um, is knighted for his services to retail, um, and then on the eve of war, Chamberlain gets hold of him and says, like, I'd like you to um, come and join the government. He's put into the Ministry of Supply, um, and he had a rather tedious job, which was basically to sort of try and um, bring the, the various bureaucratic arms of the, of the Ministry of Supply together so that they could clothe the British Army and, the, and our, and our ally, allies. There's one particular problem he found, which was that the department that was making trousers seemed to be unable to speak or communicate with the department that was making buttons. And Lord Wilton <laughs> went to Downing Street and he said he famously slammed the front door on his departure on that visit because he, he couldn't get an answer. He finally managed to put the department of buttons and trousers together after he sent a memo saying that if, if I'm unable to do this, British men will march to war and their trousers will fall down. <laughs> um, so he came across the, the, the sort of what he saw as an implacable white bull machine. And he said, well, if I can't win, again, win it, I'll, I will just break the machine. So he was quite successful um, in those few months when he was at Ministry of Supply. And again, 59, he was about 60 at that point, he thought, well, I've done my job, I'll retire. And Chamberlain then called him up and said, I want to see you. And it was in around September 1939. And he said, I've got another job for you. I want you to become Minister of Food. And uh, actually, it was, it was actually yeah, it was important. And um, 
And Morton sort of thought, oh, God, I really want to go back to my day job. So he went back, talked to Maud, his wife, and she said, look, of course, you, you must do it. You've got to, this is an extraordinary opportunity to be able to serve your country. So he becomes Minister of Food um, on, on, on Chamberlain's request. There's a reshuffle. Um, yeah, correctly, 4th of April 1940, the, um, uh, his, his appointment is, is announced, Lord Walton for food. It's a bit of a, a reshuffle. And then for about three months, he's Minister of Food. Then, of course, there's another change. Churchill becomes Prime Minister. And there's this famous weekend when all of the cabinets are sort of hustling and desperate to try and get into the new cabinet. Walton wrote to Churchill basically to explain that he had no political ambitions and he'd be very happy to go back and run his uh, business. He's probably the only uh, minister who wasn't hustling and hassling to try and get a job. And finally on the Monday, Churchill summoned him to Downing Street and looked him up and down and sort of and asked him if he wanted to do it. And Walton sort of said, look, I'm very happy to continue, but if you don't need me. And Churchill appointed him, you know, reappointed him not with exactly a ringing endorsement. He said, um, well, you better see how you get on. <laughs> so <laughs> Churchill was not um, a great fan of, of Walton. I think Churchill was rather like a lot, of, a lot of politicians. He rather resented the idea of politicians being elevated into government by being you know, given a peerage and not having to get into politics the hard way. You know, Churchill, like so many other politicians, had gone up that greasy pole. They'd knocked on doors. They'd been on the doorstep. And if you've done that, and you've become, you know, you've, you've been a politician for many, many years, and you see sitting next to you in cabinet a man who's just had a successful retail career and is suddenly a glorious politician with a grand name, it's probably quite irritating. And so Churchill was quite circumspect when it came to um, his views of Walton. Um, and actually the pair of them, in the ensuing months and years, would actually come to blows quite often. Uh, it seems that Churchill rather seems to actually sort of um, disparage the passion, um, but we'll come on to that in a little while. So on the eve of, of his appointment, um, Walton has a meeting with Sir Henry French. Uh, French is the long-standing um, civil servant of the Ministry of Food, and the, the, the pair of them meet. Uh, Walton assumed that he would have a couple of weeks to get under the, the to get his feet under the desk and kind of come up to speed with the subject. Um, but French said, actually, you've got a meeting tomorrow in front of the press and fellow politicians where you're going to be announcing uh, our new policy. And Walton was, this annoyed Walton because he hadn't understood the brief yet. And he sort of argued with French, well, I'm, surely I need to understand my brief before I give a speech. And French sort of said, no, of course not. So he realized that's exactly, you know, if that didn't happen in politics, you have a speech and you gave your speech. So um, Walton stayed up all night that night, mugging up on the challenge that he faced, and it was considerable. And I think it's really important to look at this, particularly uh, in a room full of people who are interested in statistics. The challenge for Walton and the government was that uh, as we went into the Second World War, the UK was a net importer of food. Our food security was pretty low. It wasn't as low as it was during the First World War, when this nation really did nearly starve. But half of all meat, most of the wheat for bread, and the vast majority of cheese, cereal, sugar, and fat, and four-fifths of fruit were being imported. And they were being imported, being imported over very, very long distances. This is a map that hung in Lord Walton's office at the Ministry of Food. And he used to look at it to remind himself of the huge challenge and the massive distances that food had to travel. Pagan, up to 2,700 miles. Bran, 6,200 miles. And you can see how our lack of self-sufficiency, um, importing butter and meat from as far away as New Zealand, bacon, eggs, wheat, and so on, uh, from Canada. And of course, as an island, this was tactically very important for the, for the Germans, for the Luftwaffe, because it meant that they could try and isolate us by attacking those merchant ships coming over from particularly across the Atlantic. And this um, staggering statistic is that 55 million tons were shipped annually, and the U-boat attacks brought that down to 12 million tons. So maintaining the, the, you know, the food supply and improving our self-sufficiency were incredibly important, both for the Ministry of Food um, 
and for the Ministry of Agriculture, so they, they worked very closely together. And you know, millions of tons of food, of course, ended up at the bottom of the ocean. So the ration that was introduced uh, wasn't so introduced as an emergency measure. It's something that had actually been planned for many, many years. And the idea was that it would be staggered. It wasn't just that war's broken out, so you have your ration book and, and, and that's it. Ration was staggered. And alongside that was a sort of PR and marketing campaign so that you would soften up the public and then announce your ration initiative. So it all started in September 39 when there was this famous day, National Registration Day, where the 45 odd million people in this country who needed to be fed, not servicemen and women who were separate, uh, had to fill in a form, give their occupation, their age and their sex, and any dependents that live with them in terms of number of children. And they were then given um, an ID. And then in, this, in the ensuing months and years, rationing was then gently filtered down um, across the country. So as I say, it wasn't always done in one in a day. So right at the beginning of January, you got butter and bacon, tea in July of 1940. You've got things like jam in 1941, cheese eggs. And interestingly enough, whilst a lot of these dry goods were rationed in 1942, sausages weren't rationed until 1943. So lots of goods were maintained. And the point was not to suddenly you know, impose a kind of catastrophic PR disaster by suddenly stopping huge amounts of food. And so there were a number of things that needed to be done in order to, be able to successfully administer it as they distributed all the ration books. I think it's interesting just looking at a picture like this. You know, we think about the food that is available today, 24 hours a day, the global ingredients that were allowed. This is the ration for two adults for a week. That's what you got. And it's quite amazing. Um, alongside, if you were able to get, um, uh, you know, other sort of wild meat, rabbits, game, for example, if you could get any fruit and so on, bread extending was never was never rationed. So there were several things that that needs to be done in order to be able to impose the ration. Then there were a few things that I certainly never knew about, and this one of the great discoveries. And I sort of I popped this thing in Colwyn Bay. What's that about? Colwyn Bay is a small Welsh seaside town full of quaint little uh, Victorian houses and streets and it's quite a pretty quiet place. And the extraordinary thing is that in July of 1940, this sleepy Welsh seaside town saw uh, a kind of fleet of rather official cars arriving in the town. Um, in particular, there was a school called Pershaw College here on the right there. Um, and the headmistress had just said goodbye to um, uh, all of her girls. It was a girls' boarding school. Um, she had just gone into her study to sort of get a cup of tea, and she was administering to some of the, the cleaning staff who were still there. And she was looking forward to a bit of a summer break, and she saw one of these cars, this sort of official car, come up the drive. She looked through the window and thought, well, it's not one of the parents whose children has forgotten her hockey sticks or something. And in due course, two men in suits knocked at the door, Introduced, them to, introduced themselves to her and explained that they were from the Ministry of Food and that they were going to be uh, they were making an acquisition of this school building for civil servants who would be arriving in the next week to 10 days. And the same thing happened right across Colwyn Bay that day. Whether you run a small boarding house, a little hotel, um, uh, whether you run a small school, whether you ran a little home for the elderly, everyone had a knock on the door. And in about 10 days, this whole town was transformed because the Ministry of Food disappeared in huge secrecy from Whitehall to Colwyn Bay. And I came across a memo written between one civil servant from one ministry to another in July of 1940, saying, I've written a letter to the Ministry of Food and I can't get an answer. Does anyone know where they've gone? <laughs> and the amazing thing is that if civil servants in London you know where the Ministry of Food has gone, then certainly German agents on the streets of London trying to infiltrate their way into the government didn't know where they'd gone. And over the course of the entire war, while the people of Colwyn Bay, and they included all the departments from the Ministry of, Ministry of Food, um, several thousand people, 5,000 men, a lot of secretaries, a lot of pencils and pens, a huge acreage of linoleum, all turned up and as they took over this little sea, sea, seaside town. And in the evenings, as they settled down for a quiet evening or went to the pub, um, they could hear the distant murmur of the Luftwaffe 
going over her head as they went trailed up the, uh, the English coast on their way to places like Coventry, Daventry, Manchester, Liverpool to do their dirties and drop their bombs. But not a single bomb dropped on Colvin Bay. So the, the sort of heart, if not the head, of the distribution system for the Ministry of Food was never attacked. And it's quite an extraordinary thing now. And um, I've, I've actually yet to go there, but I would love to go. The, the Colvin Bay Hotel was the Ministry of Food's headquarters. And Lord Bolton, even though he was quite a modest man, he had an antipathy, he didn't like Colvin Bay. And he had a small, he had the train line diverted so that he wouldn't have to get out of the train um, to walk too far just to get to the hotel. Um, and he had a special brother, like I wrote in writing books, like a sort of corrupt African potentate. He could literally embark from his train and get straight into the hotel and have meetings and then, and then quickly disappear back to London. He kept a small office just off Portman Square with a skeleton staff, and that's where he basically operated when he wasn't traveling around the country. <clears throat> so, putting the whole ministry in Colwyn Bay was one of the really important things that he and his team did. The other thing was um, PR, marketing. Um, he had a real knack for speaking to journalists and the public. Now, I talked about how Walton had stayed up all night, and he wrote in his diaries that it was like he was about to face a court, and what a court, he wrote in his book. Because the next day, he was presented to the journalists, and he was at the Queen Elizabeth Hall, which is now demolished. It was just by where the new BBC building is. There's a hotel in there. And he was on stage. So Henry French, another civil servant, and he was there. French um, introduced him. And Wilson, just before he got up, he first of all pictured. He looked beyond the room. He could see the audio engineers recording it for the radio. And he, and he wrote that he imagined, uh, not the people in the room, but imagined the people listening. And he imagined, he, he, he sort of, he was as bold to be immodest to imagine that there was a woman sitting at home and her wife comes in from work and she says, shh, Lord Walton's on the radio. So he spoke directly to them. And what he said is fascinating because just before he stood up and took to the microphone, he had two layers of notes on his desk in front of him. One was quite clearly the typed up speech that Sir Henry French had given the night before. And there were these other notes. And just before he stood up, he looked over at French, moved his speech to the side, picked up his own notes, and gave a completely different speech to the one that his head of uh, his main civil servant had given him. And what he did was not just present rather dryly the ongoing campaign for the Ministry of Food and stats and so on and the challenge. What he did was he used very emotive language. He likened the women at home um, to the home front where the soldiers were. He called it the kitchen front. And he talked about how women had to man the kitchen front and be economical because they had to feed their families. And he really touched a nerve when he did that. And journalists really warmed to him as well. He, had a, he still had a bit of a hint of the Lan Lancashire accent that he'd had growing up. And people rather liked this plain talking man. Um, all the journalists used to gather week after week uh, in a pub called The Bunch of Grapes, just off Portland Square. They'd have a few beers and they'd go in and they'd have their on the record briefing with Lord Walton. And they always liked the way that he spoke directly to them. And so in the first few months and the first year, uh, it was going quite well. Walton would give some quite punchy speeches. Um, he immediately started talking about how Britain was cut out of luxury foods. He wrote all these editorials and all sorts of newspapers, you will not go hungry, why we will never starve. Um, and he got a pretty good ride. But within a year, the press has started getting bored with him. The, uh, his, a lot of his fellow ministers had become rather tired of him. There'd been a few cock-ups within the ministry, and the press got tired of him. And what I was amazed by was some of the coverage that he got. One of the other amazing resources that I found, up in his grandson's house in Scotland, there was a whole sort of um, shrine devoted to this man, and there was a whole load of boxes. And I found these files filled with press cuttings. Lord Walton was so proud of the fact that he journeyed from near poverty to successful retailer, had made millions of pounds and owned a lovely house down in Sussex. He had a servant and a lift, he went through it very proudly. And every time he was mentioned, his secretaries at Lewis's would, would cut out that, that cutting. And so there I had in front of me, page after page, the most extraordinary resource of newspaper cuttings. So I didn't have to go to the microfiche of the Liverpool Echo 
or the Daventry Advertiser to find a small nugget about Lord Walton. There it was cut out. And what's interesting is I could see the ebb and flow of his press coverage. And after a year, he started being assaulted by the press, talking about this Walton wobble can't go on, MPs attack, ministry for muddle. And I love the idea of reading about this because we have this idea that you know, government and press were all sort of on song as we fought the Germans, but none of it. You know, these, the, 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 a lot of politicians had to fight and brief the press. And what's interesting is I could read in the diaries, the day after a lot of these pieces came out, he, he dined with several of the newspaper proprietors, had a real go at them, accused them of actually damaging Britain's war interests. And then a, f a few days later, his press coverage starts to, starts to improve. <laughs> um, but um, there was lots of gossip. Lord Walton may leave, lordly failure. Next to maintain the nation's supplies, Lord Walton's most vital job is to maintain the nation's confidence in the Ministry of Food. Lord Walton is falling down on that job. Food folly. This isn't good enough, Lord Walton. So he really started getting a kicking. There was the, the odd, quite humorous thing I found out. This is a great little story from the Daily Sketch I'll read to you. Lord Walton tells me that the people are always asking him if he can cook. The answer is he cannot. He adds, there was once a sausage shop at the back of the Bank of England. A man asked the owner to lend him five pounds. I'm sorry, answered the sausage maker. The Bank of England and I have an understanding. I agree not to lend money, and the bank agrees not to make sausage. <laughs> <laughs> that, says Lord Walton, is my position. I leave from cooking to the experts, the British housewives. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, Walton and uh, Churchill had a slightly tricky relationship. But what, the other thing that I, I, I noticed from reading his diaries, and we were just talking about this earlier, is that one of the things I discovered was that Walton also had a pretty savage view of his fellow politicians. And there's a wonderful scene that I paint in the book, and it's on the, the day of Neville Chamberlain's funeral, when the great and the good, the most powerful men, and it was men, um, in the British establishment and politicians, all sat there in their great coats in Westminster Cathedral, uh, a building that had its windows blasted out, so the chill air, chill, cold November air, blasted in through. And these hugely important men sat shivering under their coats. And Walton looked at them all, and then that night started to write about them. Um, he said, um, uh, uh, I sometimes wish Lord George were back in the cabinet. With his vast knowledge, he would make most of these other people look like office boys, he said, looking at all these people. There's no allegiance to Churchill. There's nobody in the government whom the public would trust. Halifax belongs to the old Munich school of appeasement. Anderson, who is the Lord President, does his best, but it's not much. He has no imagination and little human <coughs> sympathy. Arthur Greenwood, who is the Minister Without Portfolio, is an economic philanderer. Ernest Bevan, the Minister of Labour and National Service, will blow himself out. He's so vain. He attacks Lord Be Beaverbrook with being a complete egotist and a bully. I don't trust egotists, uh, Beaverbrook, he says. Then he wrote about Lord Reith, man of BBC. He said he's had more, he has more egotism than anyone I've ever come across. Uh, there were signs that he'd done some good work some years ago at the BBC. <laughs> he's not accomplished much since. <laughs> and then Wal Walton's wife, Maud, also weighs in on the subject of Reith. In her own diary, she said of Reith, he organised the BBC until neither he nor the staff could stand him or it any longer. <laughs> Um, and he said he's had, a, after a succession of failed attempts at running ministries, he's been promised a barony. He is too conceited, she continues about Reith, to see that he's being shelled, and now he thinks he'll be the next Prime Minister. God help the country. So both Walton and Maud were a bit disparaging of their fellow MPs. But what about Fred and Winston? Now, it's interesting that when Winston Churchill first met Walton, when he gave him, he sort of reappointed him to stay in the Ministry of Food, he'd forgotten that actually the pair had met many, many years ago. When Fred was a young student in, I think it was Liverpool, um, and Churchill was standing for the Liberal cause, he went campaigning in that town, in that city. And he gave a speech one afternoon in one of the sort of town halls there. And uh, Walton had heard about this man, so he thought he'd go in there and see what all the fuss was about. And he sort of hid himself behind a grand piano in this hall. And Churchill came in, made a big tub thumping speech, and then um, there was a rousing chair, and then he asked if there were any questions, and his hand appeared. And certainly, it was just so happened to be the young man standing behind the piano. And there was Fred Marcus, and he asked him, 
to look at. Interesting what I've heard, what you've had to say. What are you, what are you going to do about the problem of unemployment? And Churchill started sort of waffling about this. And there happened to be a group of rather angry socialists in the back row who started shouting and jeering at Churchill as he started to rather give a rather sort of vague answer. And then they started moving towards the platform, at which point Churchill was ushered away by his aides. Um, and when he, when, he, when he saw Walter, he, little did he know that this man had caused in the riot all those years ago. But so the two of them met, and as I said earlier, um, uh, Churchill didn't sort of have much time for him. But also, um, they spent a lot of time sort of sending rather sort of rude memos to each other. Churchill was always telling him off, telling him, saying that he sort of overstepped the mark. He didn't like the way that he seemed to rather enjoy reprimanding people threatening people with new legislation if they even strayed into the sort of areas of, of the grey market. And Churchill certainly did seem to um, disparage the ration. Um, he wrote some rather amusing letters. This is, this is um, one of his very helpful letters to Fred, where he says at the end, um, this is his view on rationing to his Minister of Food, I should have thought that an exaltation not to leave anything on the plate and to take small portions with, if necessary, a second helping could be a wise step. Now, uh, these are only my personal views. <laughs> very, very helpful. Um, and then he also had his junior staff write to other junior staff in the Ministry of Food asking for extra coupons, extra points. Uh, dear Mrs. Baker, as we've now exhausted the points vouchers which you sent on March the 20th, I should be grateful you can form me a further supply. So each time um, Churchill ran out of sugar or jam or anything like that. He ran out of coupons. He would get his junior staff to write to junior members of the Ministry of Food so they would never go across his debt and make sure that Chequers and Downing Street was certainly a refuge from the ration. And as I say in the book, where the, where the British public rather tightened their belt, it seems that Churchill during the war rather loosened his. And there was one occasion when um, the two of them met. Walton was arguing passionately at one point for budget and particularly to have extra tonnage of shipping allocated to the Ministry of Food. He said that too, mu too, mu too many ships were being used to transfer steel across the Atlantic. There were too many ships being used to transfer troops and he needed shipping to transfer food. And he wasn't able to get his message across. So he went to Chequers and um, Churchill sort of sent him an invitation. And it's interesting because right in the middle of the war, he turned up on a Friday afternoon no sign of Churchill. At five o'clock, Churchill emerged, and Moulton wrote in his diary that it was obvious that Churchill had been asleep all afternoon, <laughs> right in the middle of the war. He turns up in his, uh, his siren suit, his sort of onesie, and, and they get stuck in, and he's never seen such an array of food at dinner. There's a sort of side plate of bristle with salmon, beef, and uh, which he sort of eagerly devoured. And then as, um, as dinner ended, they went into the drawing room, and um, Churchill put on some rousing marching music because he, he said this would stir the spirit as they had their debate and their conversation about shipping. Yeah. And as, this, uh, as the music was glaring, a secretary of war came in and gave Churchill the news that some uh, German uh, aggressive frigates were approaching the French coast and were about to attack some French ships. And Churchill turned the music up, got onto bomber command, and ordered the Royal Air Force go and bomb the Germans. And Wilton wrote that it was wonderful seeing the warlord at work. And it's amazing seeing that we have these ideas to church and we find a new resource, a new source in your discovery. He really was like that, sort of drinking, playing loud marching music and ordering the bombing of the Germans. Um, they continued debating until the early hours. And then finally Churchill took Wilton to bed and um, was just leaving him at his bedroom door. And Wilton gave him finally a note of the amount of shipping that he wanted. And it seemed that Churchill then relented. And as Walton tried to go to sleep that night, he could hear Churchill, the other end of the house, barking out orders and sort of working, working through the night. It does seem, however, that the two became sort of reconciled, um, particularly towards the end of the war, and I'll come on to that in a minute. So Walton had many times. One of the most extraordinary things that he did, and why I think he's important, is that here was a, a businessman operating in the political sphere. And it meant that he did, he did things in a way that no other politician would have done. And there's several extraordinary examples of this. Um, one of which is that uh, he liked to use the treasury, really, as his personal sort of private banker. <laughs> he spent a lot of time buying you know, futures in wheat right across uh, the world. 
using all sorts of names, but never the name of the British government. There's one occasion where Wilton uh, uh, was, at the, was at Canada House. It was a grand ceremony. They were celebrating um, uh, the fact that Canadians were going to sell the British 10 million bushels of wheat. There were <coughs> trumpeteers, beautiful pieces of documentation was laid out for signature, special gold pens were there, and the Canadian ambassador signed, and Wilton signed. There was lots of clapping and speech, speeches and so on. And then this was over 10 million bushels. Uh, then Wilson goes back to his office and he write, writes in his diary that this rather amused him because um, just four days before that, he'd bought 25 million bushels of wheat uh, without actually putting on any public record. Because he said that's how business is done. You know, you, you, you ring up and you do it on the, on the telephone. Um, so he spent quite a lot of time surreptitiously doing that uh, he did get a bit in trouble with Kingsley Wood, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, particularly on one day where he rang him up and said, look, I need £100 million pounds by four, four o'clock. <laughs> uh, I was going to do a deal. Uh, and Wood said to him, so Kingsley said, you, well, you have to present a paper, and that must then be circulated, and then we can give you approval. And Wilson said, no, 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 no they can't, we can't do that. You know, that if, if it becomes public knowledge that I'm the one buying um, this commodity, the price will shoot up. So anyway, Wood relents and gives him the money, and that evening, Walton goes over to apologize to Wood. Um, and at, although Wood says, you know, it, uh, you know I, I hope you don't have to do that again too many times, but you are the only minister who's ever come and apologized uh, to me for actually saving the British government money. <laughs> so he tackled the problems of supply as a businessman. Um, one, uh, I suppose, of the most sort of famous moments, um, uh, a man called uh, um, Sir William, I think it's Root, came to his office one morning and said he had a huge problem. Um, and the problem was with sugar. Now, given the fact that our um, global supplies were so fragmented, they were so sparse, it meant that if you were a, a good sugar trader, you could become incredibly powerful. And it just so happened that a man called Pasha Aboud happened to be one of the world's biggest importers and exporters of sugar. He had factories, and he was operating in Alexandria. He was actually educated on the Clyde in Glasgow and then spent the rest of his life as a sugar trader in Alexandria. Now, the problem for Walton, as presented by his head of <coughs> sugar, was that Aboud, because he controlled the supply, was asking the British government to pay a far too high a price for sugar. And Sir William said, there's nothing we can do about it. We either pay the price and we break our budgets for every other commodity, or we don't buy the sugar, in which case it's a calamity because we won't have sugar. And he thought this was a Im completely impenetrable problem. But Walton had another idea. He had an idea. He asked uh, his department to get hold of the Lloyds of London and to see if they would uh, agree to charter a ship from New Zealand where he gathered there was a large amount of sugar. And he said to Sir William, I, you know, I, I, once they've got the agreement, let me know. And so William said, well, you're crazy. We can't transport sugar from New Zealand to the United Kingdom. It's completely impossible. The distances are too great. The dangers are too great. And Walton said, no, no, no. What I'm doing is I'm going to actually export sugar from New Zealand to Alexandria. Because if a boon won't bring his prices down, I'll sell sugar in Alexandria and I'll bring the prices down. And so he let the sugar traders of Alexandria know there was a new sugar trader in town. Now, he had no actual intention of doing this. But that brinkmanship resulted in, two days later, a telegram arriving from Pasha Aboud at Walton's office, seeking an audience. And Aboud flies into London, meets Walton in his office, and Walton is at his most sort of charming, magnanimous, well, I know nothing of sugar. You're an Egyptian, you're a patriot. I'm sure you want to sell us your sugar, and I'm sure we can give you a price. And so, uh, over the next few days, Aboud and the ministry negotiate. And Walton has touched all the right points. This man realizes he's met his match and he agrees to a sugar deal. And then there's a dinner which is put on to celebrate this deal, of which speeches are made. And there's a sort of young Tory upstart who stands up and says in front of Abood, I imagine you didn't think you'd get the skin taken off you by Lord Walton. And Abood was so embarrassed, he kind of went red with rage. And Walton saw this and stood up and said, Mr. Abood is nothing but a patriot and he's agreed to sell us sugar because he wants us to win the war. At which point Abood stood up and said, in front of the whole assembled throng, 
I decided I'm not going to sell you any sugar. Because why? He says, no. Because of my respect for old Walton, I'm going to give you 100 million tons. Mm -hmm. So Walton not only gets the sugar, he gets 100 million tons for free. <laughs> um, except he wasn't that stupid to actually be suckered by this man. And so he agreed that he would pay for it, or he would certainly, if they had, and if they had any sugar left, he'd return it. And Abu, there's a lovely postscript to the story, in the fact that at the end of the war, Abu wrote to Walton and said, I so enjoyed our dealings, will you join my board? Mm -hmm. um, one of the nice things about this was I actually got an, uh, an email about three months ago from a man saying that he was Pasha Abu's grandson. Mm -hmm. And he said he rather introduced my grandfather's name, who's actually very, a very decent man who would not have tried to rip off the British government. <laughs> anyway, we had lunch and I presented him with all the material. Mm -hmm. and great friends. So, um, Walton had this, this, this knack of dealing with people that no other politician would have. He dealt with politics um, as, as a businessman would. Um, he also had a fair amount of luck. Now, in his memoirs, he claims that actually there was almost no black market at all in this country. But of course there was, there was a quite a large, but what there was, unlike in Germany where there was a big black market, we had quite a large grey market. And he certainly didn't want to attack that because that spirit of economy is the spirit of the grey market where you get a little bit of this and that in order to try and survive. Um, and so while he maintained there wasn't a grey black market, there was a bit more of a grey market. By 1943, Britain's food security had improved, but also we had a very successful harvest. There was actually a massive glut of potatoes. We had almost too many potatoes. Um, and his press improved, and um, towards the end of the war, he was moved from the Ministry of Food and given the post of, um, to run the Ministry of, of Reconstruction. The idea of building homes um, to be ready for soldiers when they when they came back from 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 war, and um, the this is a, I think the interesting juxtaposition here is that a man born in Salford ends his life in his grand house down in Sussex. Um, after the end of the war, he was so appalled by the fact that Churchill lost the election that he um, decided to join the Conservative Party for the first time. Um, and he was made chairman of the party. And then he travelled up and down the, the country, um, reorganising the Conservative Party in a way that he'd rather reorganise the Ministry of Food. And then the Tories got back in, I think it was um, 1953, and then he was made an earl out of uh, the gratitude from the, from the Conservative Party for that work. <coughs> and um, he spent his sort of last days um, in Arundel there in, in, in Sussex. And I think that you know, one of the legacies is, if we look at the fact that, you know, despite the fact that, as I said earlier, you know, we have all the food that we could possibly have, we wish for, yet we are obese and sicker than ever. You know, obesity is now um, cost the British government more than, than sort of global terrorism. Um, it's an extraordinary problem, and you know, actually, this looks rather like it's quite healthy. <laughs> we 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 shopping, but um, Britain came out of the war healthier than ever. Our levels of obesity were you know, almost negligible. Uh, infant mortality rates improved, our dental health improved. Um, the fat rich got slimmer and the slim poor got a little bit fatter. And so there really was this equilibrium of, of health through the ration. So if anyone ever wonders to you know, which diet works, is it the 5-2, is it the caveman, is it paleo? Well, there's only one diet that's actually been tested on, a, on a, an entire nation, and that's the ration diet. So the ration diet does work. However, I think it would be quite hard to administer these days, given the fact that we have so much choice these days. So um, that's where we are these days. Leave so, <laughs> you with that cheery image. So, um, so that's me. For if you've got any questions, I'm very happy to um, answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you.